discuss with you a range of things, some <coughs> having to do with domestic policy, some having to do with American foreign policy. Let me ask if you can hear me. The mic is a little close, uh, far from my, my mouth. Uh, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. uh, but the beginnings of which have to do with democracy. I don't believe that conferences and discussions and meetings are useful unless we use them as occasions to think about ourselves and our responsibilities in a democratic society. And our responsibilities as human beings, as global citizens in a changing world. Our responsibilities for the direction of that world. There is an inclination in America to be insular, to be parochial, to, to, to ignore anything that develops outside of the confines of our own narrow existence. And so that Americans have a tendency to care little about <coughs> things going on as near to us as Canada and certainly as far away as some other parts of the world. We also have, I think, a tendency which is tragic when it occurs in the world's most powerful nation of taking a snapshot of the world as it is and freeze framing the conditions as if they were conditions that had no sources in history, uh, is, as if they were to be understood without attribution. We think of democracy as something that is static, that you discharge your responsibility in a democracy when you get up on any voting Tuesday morning and go out and vote. Without understanding that the exercise of the ballot is simply a ritual of democracy. It is not the fundamental responsibility of people who live in democratic societies. The fundamental responsibility is the responsibility to make oneself enlightened about the conditions of the world in which we live and to create in ourselves an understanding of how our nation may have some responsibility historically for those conditions. And so the past is very much joined to the present. The past is a predictor of the future. For democracy is not static. It is always something <laughs> becoming something. Today's America <coughs> is different from yesterday's. And tomorrow's is different from today's. <coughs> the change may be incremental, but it is significant and important. Dangerous indeed is the tendency to take what you would call a precious freedom for granted. Dangerous indeed is the tendency to take abundance for granted. For the world, 50 years now, <coughs> from now, for America, 50 years from now will be fundamentally different from the America in which you now live. By the middle of this century, Asian Americans, Latino Americans, African Americans, and Native Americans will comprise the new American majority. 
If one sees America as a European American country now, <coughs> that perception undermined by a new, dramatically new reality will be dramatically altered within the next 50 years. And so it means that Americans, not for reasons of morality, but for reasons of practicality, will have to learn to relate to each other fundamentally differently than we have been able to relate to each other thus far in our history. The ground is moving beneath this democracy. <laughs> And some of us distracted by 30 hours of television, by any one thing on a menu of instant gratifications, as my wife calls the shopping mall the American church. <laughs> distracted, we have not noticed the ground moving. <laughs> beneath this democracy. Politicians will not tell us they like to bring happy news. I was the co-chair of Ralph Nader's campaign. I thought Ralph brought real news. I thought Gore and Bush were almost indistinguishable. Politicians are not leaders. They are people who want to get elected. They don't cause you to think about the real issues. They are, in the nicest sense of the word, wonderful opportunists. <coughs> but the conditions about which we have to be concerned, if we are not vigilant, will claim our attention in critical mass when it is too late to do anything about the problems that are upon us. We look at Africa now, and you see conditions in countries that are reported in your newspapers totally without analysis, that produce in you a hardening of prejudice that America has already created. And so you see a Congo in turmoil, but you do not know and you have not been told that Dwight David Eisenhower gave his approval to the order to assassinate Congo's first elected president, Patrice Lumumba. You do not see and you cannot know that for 30 years we imposed on Congo a leader who was responsive to American Cold War interest, not to the interest of the people of that country. You do not see and you cannot know that apartheid was not just the meanness of whites against blacks in South Africa but a policy that protected the selfish interest of Western investors who benefited from apartheid materially like slavers benefited from slavery. You do not know and you cannot see what has happened over the last 30 years in Liberia, in Somalia, in so many countries that are now in turmoil, but in turmoil <coughs> because largely of American policy. Democracy does not work if it is not enrooted in an enlightened citizen. If you do not know, those in power make decisions on our behalf that put us in serious situations around the world. And all too often, young American men and women are sent to die in wars, the origins of which they have not a clue. And the Johnson administration had a solution at hand 
to the Vietnam War. Henry Kissinger, working then for Nixon, who wanted to be president, wrecked the negotiations so that Humphrey would fail and Nixon would win. Four years later in Paris, Kissinger agreed to the same terms that he had wrecked four years before. In the interval, 20,000 American young men and women died in Vietnam. <coughs> For they did not know. And Kissinger, perhaps one of the major human rights <coughs> violators of our time, honored only in his own land, who may one day be brought to trial before international tribunals, for human rights crimes. Kissinger did this at the expense of these many lives. But this comes as new information to most American citizens. So many things in the world seem like different stages which are not. They simply are one thing morphing into another and labeled in a different way, like slavery morphed into colonialism. Colonialism morphed in Africa into the Cold War. The Cold War has morphed into globalization. The labels change, and the eras look somewhat different, but they're still largely people with advantage taking advantage of people without advantage. Slavery didn't happen because whites are mean and blacks are virtuous. Slavery happened because it was immensely profitable to those who ran it in the US for 246 years as an industry. <coughs> the hand of the past is always on the present. The conditions wrought by slavery are with us now. <coughs> and they have projected us onto a future course in our relations in America that are indeed frightening. I'm going to read for you a few facts that should disturb you in a democracy. <coughs> and I wonder if you knew about them before I say them. Shouldn't we be disturbed when a democratic country with one twentieth of the world's population has one fourth of the world's prisons? Shouldn't we be disturbed and ask why when a country with two million prisons, prisons has half of them African American? Why? What condition gave rise to that? Shouldn't we be concerned that in a state like New York State, from 1817 to 1981, the state of New York built 33 prisons. But from 1982 to 1999, the state of New York built 38 prisons. In less than 20 years, after beginning in 1817, in the last 20 years, the state of New York has doubled its number of state prisons. At the time of the Attica riot in 1971, New York State had 12,500 prisoners. By 1999, New York State had 71,000 prisons. In 1974, Americans in state prisons numbered 187,500. By 1999, the number was 711,700 prisoners. In America today, 
African Americans comprise 14% of all drug users. But from that 14%, somehow African Americans account for 55% of all drug convictions. 75% of all prison admissions. 14% of the users. 75% of all admissions. Under one wing of the American criminal justice system or another, <coughs> one in 15 young white males will find them. One in 10 young Latino males. One in three young African American males. Think about slavery and where we've been and where we're going. I've always believed that you cannot understand public policy from reading newspapers <coughs> or from taking courses at the finest universities. You will read about the policies. You will take classes on history and you will learn dates and events and regurgitate the information on exams. But the question's always not so much what happened and when it happened. The key question in any understanding is why it happened. You follow public policy best. You followed Henry Kissinger's destruction of the Vietnam negotiation process for which he, in the last analysis, received a Nobel Prize. <laughs> you follow it best when you don't ask alone the question, what happened, when it happened, but why? But you ask, in addition to that, who benefits? It is never in the text. And you understand public policy even better when you can follow the money. Little towns across America that have been failing for a long time, like Malone, New York. Malone, New York is a tiny town in upstate New York, <coughs> an all-white city, best known for its venue for the Dutch Schultz trial. Dutch Schultz was a mafioso colleague of Al Pallone. Uh, Al Capone, in the late 30s. Most people have never heard of Malone. The town then began to go down, lost its Sears, lost its stores, lost its hotel. Everybody in desperate straits in Malone. And then Malone got wind of what Governor Rockefeller had done in New York. Governor Rockefeller had passed laws called the Rockefeller drug laws, meaning that you could go to jail for 15 years for a first-time conviction for a non-violent drug offense. And then catching on to that way, Governor Cuomo in New York began to build the prisons to house the people who would commit the drug offenses. And then Malone said, well, where are these prisons going to be? And applied for one of them. Malone got two, and with it, the tiny town of Malone got 1,400 new jobs, all white, 18 new holes for their golf course. They got a rise in their census count, which gave them greater strength in Congress and more federal dollars. But they didn't have to worry about the inmates voting because they had been convicted felons they would lose their right to vote. <coughs> the little town of Malone was resuscitated economically by an inmate population that was 82% black and Hispanic. It is happening across America. The state of California has spent five times more in the last 20 years building prisons than it has universities. Everybody is trying to build a prison, even little towns in Missouri like Licking, Missouri, got a prison. And all we 
always the towns are rural and predominantly white. And always the inmate populations are 82, 84% black and Hispanic. And always the large part of the population has been convicted for nonviolent drug offenses. These prisoners are resuscitating the American economy in the same way that for 246 years in America, slave labor <coughs> carried the American economy. But we can't see it because we look in America, but we do not see. And now we're developing what anybody should be alarmed about private prisons, meaning that the, and what, what they're doing is undermining <coughs> low-income people outside of prison because corporations are now having products made in prisons. Right? When you book a flight and call reservations on any major airline, the likelihood is that you are talking to an inmate. And so these jobs are putting out of work low-end people who are not in prison. But the profit turn for the corporations that are getting products manufactured for them are high. But shouldn't we be concerned in a democracy when the only way the value of your <coughs> stock can go up is to get more prisons? And so we pass laws that ensnare people to put them in prison to work to produce products for almost no wage at all. Where does that come from? Its history is old. It is rooted in an American <coughs> discrimination against African Americans and Hispanic Americans. It is as old as slavery. But think 50 years into the future. If one does not feel a moral concern about this disproportion, <coughs> this inequity, this inequality, think 50 years into the future when blacks, Hispanics, Asians, and Native Americans comprise the new American majority. Many years ago, South Africa at about the same time America was being settled by English settlers. South Africa, whites arriving from Holland, had to make the decision as to whether, with respect to any damage they had done, they would work to repair <coughs> or repress. They made the decision to repress. But the numbers, operated against them. Now in America, almost from the date of the Emancipation Proclamation, we have been faced with the decision to repair or repress. What we are doing in the prison industry all across America would indicate that we have chosen the road to repress. But when the new majority emerges in America, how many people can you lock up? How much of a society can you put behind bars? At what point does it simply become unworkable? When does it fall of its own weight? We're moving in that direction. And if we're going to address these massive social problems, the time is now. I talked to you this morning on the occasion of Black History Month. Every democratic society, every successful society <coughs> is rooted largely in its capacity and in its carriage and in its commitment to tell the whole of all of its story to all of its people. For people need to have history. I used to think when I was in college that history was something that was 
taught because teachers were sadistic. <laughs> and I was young and powerless. And you had to learn that stuff. And you, you all read your history books and you read chapter and the test is tomorrow. And you, you're just really you're trying to memorize, you recite it to each other, you know. All of you forget what you read the moment you've taken the test. Some poor few, tragic few of you, forget what you have read before you take the test. <laughs> You're just trying to learn the dates and the events without interpretation. And you, 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 you really give it the approval, the imprimatur of gospel. If it's in the book, it's true. If it's not in the book, it must not have happened. I've always been disturbed about this notion of Black History Month. I'm conflicted about it because it does two things. If we think about it, it tells us on its face that American history is a massive deceit because any history that is presented to us as history must imply that this is the whole story. <coughs> And then if you concede to have a Black History Month, you've just conceded that American history is a lie. Because you can't segregate history. History is history. The history of California certainly will tell us about the role of Hispanics. What kind of American history can we have without the role of Asian Americans? Can we begin any history in America without telling first to our children in pre-K, the history of the first Americans, whose history we have completely eradicated, whose songs we don't know, whose cultures we don't appreciate. And so we've come to see history taught to us as this truncated version of some extension of the European civilization into America. And then we're taught black history in February and given as my friend uh, says Dick Gregory, the month with some of the days missing. <laughs> and every February we will learn ritually how many things George Washington Carver did with that peanut. <laughs> and then we'll talk about Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman and all of this and all of that as if our history began in slavery. And we're left to believe that what we're not told was not there to be told. A people cannot be successful without their story. Jews can see back 4,000 years into their history because they need to be able to see 4,000 years back into their history. But the greatest crime of slavery, not just the material crime, the greatest crime, was to strip a people of a story of themselves. I was taught in college that Greek civilization, or civilization began in Greece. Can you imagine that? Like two Greek guys in downtown Athens a long time ago. They're bored. Athens is hot in the summer. And they don't know what to do. So one of them says to the other, what can we do? And the other one said, I know what we can do. We can invent a civilization. <laughs> and on Monday, you had no civilization. <clears throat> on Tuesday, you had Greek civilization. That is the most absurd thing that was ever taught to any student anywhere. The great Greek historian, the so-called father of history, Herodotus, wrote 500 years before the birth of Christ that everything that Greece was, its calendar, its division of the year into 12 parts, its math, its science, its gods, its mythology, its practice of carving figures from stone, everything that Greece was, so wrote Herodotus. It was derived from the civilizations and cultures of Egypt, Ethiopia, and the empires and civilizations of the African interior. But we're told nothing about it. I saw Morley Safer some years ago on 60 Minutes talking about who would be the next pope in the Catholic churches. 
undertaking this inquiry, the College of Cardinals has put together a shortlist, and on the shortlist is Cardinal Lorenzi of Nigeria. And Morley Safer is asking Catholic Church officials, could it be possible <laughs> that the Catholic Church, the College, the College of Cardinals, will select an African to head the Catholic Church? Wouldn't that be a breakthrough? Woo! <laughs> first 500 years of the Catholic Church, there were three popes from Africa, and we don't know anything about it. The thousands of Jewish women in America named Zipporah. I don't know if they know why they named Zipporah or not. We all know who Moses was. I knew who Moses was in utero. Everybody knows who Moses was. Zipporah was the wife of Moses. She was Ethiopian and black, <coughs> as were most of the rivers of the Old Testament. But we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about Cush and Aksum and Monomatapa. We don't know anything about Mali. And we don't know anything about Sangha. We don't know anything about Ghana or that Mali and gold in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries underpin the entire intercontinental trading system. We don't know. We haven't been told. Our history left that out, both for those who were enslaved and those who enslaved them. <coughs> People who that cannot know their story, cannot understand their full worth through the ages. My mother used to say to me when I was a child all kinds of things that made no literal sense. She'd come in and she'd say, son, you cannot get blood out of a turnip. That meant, don't ask me for any money. <laughs> and then she used to come into my room and say, your room looks like the wreck of the Hespus. What in the hell is the Hespus? <laughs> It was a ship, but I didn't know where it sailed. But I knew it meant I was supposed to clean up my room. <laughs> and everybody said, everybody in America knew the phrase, from here to Timbuktu. For all of my childhood, I had no idea what or where Timbuktu was. Timbuktu was the leading learning center in the known world. Its library unexcelled in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. It was and is in Mali, West Africa. But we don't know anything about it. When I was writing this book, my wife told me, she said, I want you to go down to the National Mall walk on the mall. I hadn't understood. I, I, you know, I used to think history is something you see in your textbooks and you learn it. But history is much more than that. It has a purpose. It is to teach Americans that they are great. That's the idea of it. And it is taught in ephemeral literature <coughs> magazines and in documentaries. It's taught in your parks and in your museums and your statues and in your monuments. And I went down to the park, to the National Mall, and I took my daughter with me. And I saw these people standing before Lincoln. You know, Americans ridicule ancestor worship. We, we don't like that. He said, that's something strange people do in strange places. But these people were standing before Lincoln, and they look, kind of looked like they were from Idaho. I don't know. They just had a kind of Idaho air. The man had on some plaid shorts that should not be worn in public. <laughs> and he had on a strange hat that people only wear on vacation, and he and his wife were swaying against each other, and they were looking up at Lincoln. They were transfixed. They were practicing ancestor worship. Because people need to do that. You can only know you can be great if you know that you have been great before. <coughs> That's why we learn history. It's why we need to know about ancient Greece and ancient Rome and ancient Turkey. It's why we need to know who built the pyramids. 
That's why we need to know the whole story of all of our peoples. And then we were walking on up the park. We saw the Vietnam War Memorial and noticed that there were no blacks there. There were thousands in the park. My daughter said, I thought you said black people fought in Vietnam. Not only did we fight, we died disproportionately. And she said, why are no black people here? We decided to count the black people on the National Mall. We saw one black man with a white woman. And we saw one black woman with a white man. And we saw one black child with a white class. And we saw three blacks who had somehow inexplicably gotten there independently. <laughs> In a city that is 60% black, we saw six blacks in a crowd of 3,000 people. And it occurred to me, this National Mall is America's advertisement of itself to the whole world. People come from everywhere. It occurred to me that we are not there because there is nothing on the Mall that has anything to do with us. <coughs> and so we walked past the Jewish Holocaust Memorial <coughs> Museum, which commemorates the loss of Jewish life at the hands of Nazis during World War II in <coughs> Europe. <coughs> We saw the Japanese Memorial Park that commemorates Japanese who were interned during World War II. We walked the length and breadth of the National Mall. We saw not one plaque, not one statue, not one brick, not one monument, not one museum, not one notice, not one name of a single one of the 30 million Africans who died making their way into the American Holocaust. The Holocaust of 246 years of American slavery. Then we went into the rotunda and I looked up as my wife told me and on the eye of the dome you see a painting painted by an Italian artist for me called The Apotheosis of George Washington and in it it's there to extol the virtues of George Washington and the new democracy. In it you see Washington surrounded by 60 robed figures in front of whom unfurled a banner e pluribus unum, out of many, one. But all 60 of the figures are white. And then you drop down to the hat band that runs around the dome of the Capitol. It's a gray frieze, depicting American history from the age of exploration to the dawn of aviation. No Douglas, no Tubman, no truth, no blacks, <coughs> no indication that slavery ever occurred. <coughs> then you drop down to floor level, you see these massive paintings in which only one person with even a smattering of melanin is represented. That is Pocahontas, and I think she is there because she is receiving the sacraments of Christianity in an English chapel. But what you're not told is that the massive sandstone blocks of which the capital is constructed Mined in Stafford County, Virginia by slaves. They were brought up the Potomac River by slaves. They were put in place by slaves and kept there by mortar stirred by slaves. Atop the Capitol, you will see a statue <coughs> called Freedom of an Indian maiden. It was cast in Bladensburg, Maryland by slaves, brought to the Capitol and hoisted to the top of the dome by slaves. The forest between the White House and the Capitol was cleared by slaves. The foundations of the White House were built by slaves. These people were never paid. Georgetown University was built by slaves who were later sold by Jesuit priests to a plantation in Louisiana. I went to Harvard Law School. I finished Harvard Law School 30 years ago. And I recall when I went there, <coughs> coming from a poor school in Richmond, Virginia. It was the first time in my life at age 26 I'd ever sat down in a class next to a white person. And there I am at the richest school in the, in the country, if not the world. Harvard has an endowment valued at more than $19 billion. Wainscoting and oil paintings. And you, you tend to think Harvard is rich because Harvard is rich. It is rich, was rich, will be rich because that's Harvard. Thirty years later did I learn what the decal on my car meant. It says up at Harvard you have the, the word veritas, which 
which means true. But above Veritas on the law school decal were three baskets of sugar cane. Thirty years, I didn't know what it meant. Then I discovered that Isaac Royale had founded the law school and endowed it through the proceeds he had gotten from the sale of slaves on an Antiguan sugar plantation. The answers to our inequality now are in the past. Poverty, like wealth, is intergenerationally inherited. Slavery didn't end in 1865. It carried forward de facto well into the 20th century. Most of us create our wealth with home equity. Restrictive covenants and redlining and mortgage discrimination have cost African Americans 80 to 90 billion dollars per generation in lost wealth. Berkeley did a study showing that wage discrimination has cost African Americans from 1929 to 1969 1.6 trillion dollars. If you start wealthy, if you start privileged, you will end wealthy and privileged. If you start poor and without privilege, the likelihood is that's where you will end up. When a government commits a major human rights crime against parts of its own citizenry or that of another, the government is obliged to do what a post-war democratic government did for Jews. You compensate the people you have wronged. Japan did it. Germany did it. Australia is wrestling with it. Canada did it. It is commonplace in the world. It is international law. It is consistent with basic precepts of common decency. African Americans have suffered the longest running crime against humanity in the world over the last 500 years. 246 years of slavery that benefited the government, and a century of de jure discrimination based on race that ran right through the 20th century. So now America is being asked to do what it has asked other people in other countries to do. We have told the Germans as recently as last year that you cannot stop compensating the victims of Nazi crimes. We've said as much to the Kosovoans, we've said it to the Bosnians, we've said it to the Rwandans, we've said it to the South Africans, we've said it to the Australians, we've said it to the Canadians. Now we must say it to ourselves. History must be done a lot with, but the one option that we never have is to bury it. We must not run from our national truth. We must teach victim and victimizer alike why one is poor and one is rich. We must all together discover anew what happened if we're going to have a future as a democratic society. We must find the courage to do that. Thank you very much. He's going to be spending the next few minutes in the bookstore signing his book for those of you who want to get that book and get it signed. For the rest of you, I'd ask, I would ask everyone just to stand for just a quick minute. Please stand. We're going to do a call and response. This is, uh, this is our Pan-African Pledge, and I want, uh, I want to, first of all, recognize that we, we do this in the official aspect of, of, of inaugurating and, and opening our conference. In your, bullet, in your booklets is this Pan-African Pledge, and what I'm going to do is just read a line, and I want you to repeat it in the call and response. I am African. I am African. 
I claim my heritage as a spiritual human being. I claim my heritage as a spiritual human being. I am intelligent, an intelligent, capable person. I am intelligent, intelligent. I recognize the common bond I have with all. African people in the diaspora. I am because we are. We are African. We claim our powerful history as a people of God. We are able to do anything as long as we do it together. We recognize the collective necessity to recognize the collective necessity of all African people wherever they may be. Of all African people wherever they may be. We are African. We are African. We are not a race. We are not a race. Yet we respond as one. Yet we respond as one. Academically. Academically. Positively. Positively. Progressively. Progressively. And effectively. And effectively. To end imperialism. And imperialism, colonialism, colonialism, racism, racism, and oppression. And oppression. We are African people. We are African people. As you remain standing, I'm just going to take a moment to recognize our our uh, our Creator God and our ancestors and our forebearers by a libation that we recognize to the four winds of the earth where African people have been dis dispersed and recognized in the diaspora over the history. We pour in the spirit of God, the spirit of our ancestors, the spirit of our forebearers, and we pour in the spirit of our future, our children and their children, and we respond by saying, Ashe, Ashe. which means be with us. Be with us, God. Be with us, ancestors. Be with us, be with us, forebearers, and be with us for our children. Ashe. Ashe. Conference is now uh, officially on board. We want to make sure that you are mindful that what you will receive over the course of the next two and a half days is something that will stir your mind, stir your soul to act upon, and not just to sit here and listen. When you take the opportunity to hear people speak and to, and to listen to panel presentators, you want to make sure that you're paying attention to what they're saying and respond to them. Is everybody with me? Yeah. Y'all with me? Yes, sir. All right, we keep going. I'd love to give you a general announcement before the next session. Those who wish to have a Autograph book, a book signed by Randall Robinson. He is now in the uh, lounge of the bookstore right across uh, from the auditorium. So if you want a book signed, please proceed to the bookstore. In the director of the City Inc. at Risk Youth Services since the year 1986. At Risk Youth Services is a community wide program which reaches out to high risk and gang-involved youth and their families by developing caring and understanding relationships together, linking them to the educational, social, and spiritual services relevant to the problems that they face in today's society. Mr. Moss is a member of the City Inc. management team and a founding member of the United for Peace organization created by at-risk youth services and several major gangs in the Twin Cities. United for Peace is dedicated to finding employment opportunities, education, and economic development for any inner city youth. Mr. Moss is formerly the co-chair of the National Peace and Justice Movement, which is responsible for peace summits across the nation, bringing the organization that we call Gangs for Peace educational needs, employment needs, and economic development. It is now based in 27 states in 63 cities and is growing rapidly. From 1966 to 1980, Mr. Moss was the executive director of The Way, a community organization on the near side that served its African American constituency with several innovative outreach and recreational programs. 
In addition to his work at the city, Mr. Moss is involved in leadership roles with several state organizations. He is a member of the Minnesota Council on Black Minnesotans, serves on the Black on Black Crime Task Force, sponsor of the Black Women United Culture and Development Group at Shakopee Prison and the St. Cloud Correctional Facility, consultant for Hennepin County's Youth Drug Task Force, consults for the Mayor's Youth Task Force in Minneapolis, Mayor of St. Paul's Research Gang Activities in the City, consultant for the Minnesota Department of Corrections, dealing with the increase of minorities in the prison system, president of the Leo Johnson Drum Corps, member of the State Prison Task Force, a member of the Steering Committee for March, and March <coughs> means men are responsible for cultivating hope, and a member of the Black Leadership Summit. Mr. Moss was the key organizer for the Minnesota Million Man March participants and a host of KMOJ's radio show, Voices from African Americans. He is recognized in the book, Our Common Ground. Mr. Moss has been a keynote speaker of the following workshops and conferences, Black Family Conference, Quad Cities, Black and Criminal Justice, National Intern Conference of Human Rights, Black Hills Nuclear Arms, National American Social Workers, Youth Issues, Minnesota State Region of, of Workers, National Conference on Corrections, National Conference for Black Publishers, and on a panel at a conference for black doctors. He has been a key speaker on civil rights and spoken at several black history programs. He has spoken at gang summits held in Kansas City, Cleveland, Minneapolis, and Toledo. He also, also lectures at several high schools, colleges, and universities, and civic organizations, and has been doing so for 30 years. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Harry Spike Moss. Minnesota, to Iowa, to Illinois, to Wisconsin, to 
Missouri to Nebraska, which was a region I was given to organize brothers to show up for the Million Man March. Along with it, I was given the honor of being the uh, Director of Cultural Affairs for the Million Man March. From that, we created an organization here in the Twin Cities that's alive and well called the Men of March. And I'm proud to be a founding member of the Men of March. But the greatest thing happened to me the first of the month of this month, the first day. The announcement went out that black Americans, year 2000, were going to arrive in the city of Chicago and they were going to sit down on their own and hammer out what we wanted for reparations. I wanted badly to be part of that history, so I went. And I can tell you, it was exciting. It was totally exciting that you took the initiative yourself, not to wait for America to make up its mind, not to run around in disbelief about what could or could not happen, but actually took it upon yourself to say, for the millions and millions of our people lost, what do we want? And we didn't get foolish and talk about money. We realized you could give many of our people a million dollars today, and they would give it back to white people tomorrow. That was not our issue. But we did this. Out of 156 to 158 years that was serious slavery, out of a total of 246 years that we worked that hard, that long, we want the next 156 to 158 to be tax free for Africans in America. Why should you pay tax to a nation that you've already gave that many years of free? Labor. We didn't want our 40 acres in a mew. We want more than 1,000 acres per family. We work the acres for free. And we don't just want acres. <coughs> we want sovereign land like the Native Americans so you can stay out of our business, so we can do and build and have what we want on our land that we earned. And let me say that again, because I don't want anybody to think black people are babies. We earn. We want free education for people who built all the education institutions off of their back. And then because historically, the money that came for most of your colleges came from the work of slaves, we want our children educated free. Why should our children be at a campus worried about money and you built most campuses in this country? This country has so driven our people crazy from the 24-hour oppression that are we doing things we normally wouldn't do? We smoke, we drink, we do drugs, we get in trouble, we go to jail, we go to prison from the pressure. That's where our crime stems from. That's where our frustration stems from. That's where our anger stems from. I remember when we thought it was far removed to see 100,000 Americans of any color incarcerated. Well, the day came a few years back, we hit a million. A day came and they said, we're real close to a million and a half. <coughs> As I stand here before you now, America has more human beings incarcerated in prison than all the countries of the world put together, and our new figure is two million people. That's not alarming to white folks because 80% of those people look like me. If you drove me crazy, and I've got 25 to 30 years or life, then allow me what you allowed yourselves. Allow my people to go home as part of our reparations. Just as they allowed you in Europe to empty your dungeons and come here and raise hell on the red man. Allow my people to go home. Don't keep them incarcerated. You don't want them anyway. 
you ain't going to treat them right anyway, allow them to go home. That's part of our reparations. We're going to have somewhere between a 10 and 20 point plan. And I know one of you out there is thinking right now, especially black, that ain't never going to happen. Guess what? We don't even hear you. We don't even care about what you think. We're going to address this the way anyone else address a lawsuit. You bring it forward and let the chips fall where they may. And if this government doesn't have the decency to repay, to repay, then you take it to the court of the world and you do everything that Brother Robin was just talking about. You state your case. Oh, we got a good one, don't we? Oh, we got a great one, don't we? I was just in Florida about uh, three weeks back. I was in Orlando. I was sitting there watching the news, and they had a documentary about a great African-American civil rights fighter. And he was their Urban League representative for Florida. And it was about the murder of that brother. And I was sitting there studying the murder of that brother, who was the first to die. And, excuse me, let me get that right, NAACP, I said earlier. What was important that he was fighting about? Between 1941 and 1952, America lynched 4,000 black men and women. The reason it was on the Florida news the majority of the lynchings took place in Florida. When folks ask about reparations, point to that. When people bring up Rosewood and how they truly leveled it, not the TV movie, how they truly leveled it, and how many days blacks going and coming from all towns close to it were murdered on the spot. Bring that up to them. Tell them about Greenwood Avenue, Tulsa, Oklahoma, one of the largest business districts we ever developed, and how white folks gunned us down and flew over with planes and bound our businesses, churches, homes, and people. When they ask us about why we want to be paid, remind them about our Wall Street. It wasn't Tulsa, it was Carolina, and how they leveled it and took it from us. Remind them of the period of the Nadine, when it was open season on black people for almost 15 to 20 years that you could kill them in any way you wanted whenever you saw them and it was legal. Associate that with our reparations. And last but not least, give them the raw facts that my brother before me just talked about. Don't let them get you caught up in cotton fields. I will be the first to admit that industry made this country multi-millionaire rich. There's no doubt about it. Cotton was needed all over the European world. And off the backs, the labor of a people beaten down by a whip in the hot southern sun without the break to run to the Burger King in a cold water faucet. We work from can't see to can't see. We only live somewhere between 20 to 30 years of life. And you were lucky if you made it that long without being crippled, maimed, or having parts of your anatomy chopped off. Remember that it's deeper than cotton. It's about every road that was built. It was about every highway that was built. It's about every school and every church and every city that was built by your hands. It's about all of the factories. It's about the railroad. It's about the shipyard. It's about the cotton, it's about the tea, it's about the coffee, it's about the sugar, it's about everything they did 
not want to do, they laid at your feet. People will be talking about reparations for the next two to three years because there will be nothing more important to Africans in America than finally being respected for a crime that was committed. And please don't confuse it with the Holocaust. Nine million Jews. No, it's the Ma'afa. The Ma'afa wiped out more than 100 million of our ancestors. The Ma'afa means that all of us in this room that are African descendants really don't know who is related to who. You just know your immediate family. You don't know who you're looking at. That's what it means. It means you really don't know your family name. You really don't know the faith that you worship. You really don't know the part of Africa you hail from. You really don't know you is the greatest tragedy that was ever inflicted on any human being, is to empty them from all of who they are. And after you've twisted off the head of my brother and sister, and turned them upside down and shook out of them thousands of years of the development of this world, we'll get to that too. You then filled it up with spook, coon, colored boy, negro, nigger screwed his head back on, said, get out there. Well, let me tell you how that African looks now that the confusion is all in his way. She's walking the street, year 2001, her whole head is blonde, and she's not even conscious. Her contacts of choice are blue, green, and gray, and she's not even conscious. She or he is raised in a family where there's no discussion about being African. Raised in a family where there's no discussion about being free. And worst of all, no discussion about being oppressed. And then you step out in the world and you question why there's racial profiling. You question why there's code four. And you question why there's no justice. You question why there's no branch of America that steps up for you. The most important statement I can make here today is that this body is celebrating 25 years. Am I right? 25 years. Out of 25 years, you have to ask yourself, how far? Did we really come? Oh, yeah. We're still dying in the streets of America. <coughs> oh, they don't use the rope the way they used to. They use chains behind pickup trucks. They don't use the rope the way they used to, but they fire at you 41 times unarmed. They don't use the ropes the way they used to, but they shoot you 33 times sitting in the car and swear up and down you were trying to get it run over them. Oh, they don't use the ropes anymore when a sister's sleeping in the car. They tell you that she raised up and pointed a gun, but they can't explain why she's hit 16 times in the back of her head and neck. How far did we come that thousands and thousands of us are not on the plantation, but thousands and thousands of us are on the concrete plantation called penitentiary, where it is written the only time slavery can be enforced is when you are incarcerated in America's penitentiary. Not only that, it is now a business. People should know. Whatever your business is, you must have the ability to produce whatever your business is. And the product of choice looks like me. Oh, you don't think much of it that the next 15 generation of black women will come up without relationships and husbands. That generations of black women will come up with their children without fathers. You don't think much of it, what they tear in the heart of your community out. 
I remember standing on this stage telling them about when I was in New Jersey and I did a tour. I spoke in four prisons a day from Saturday to Saturday, four a day. New Jersey had 24,200 and some men incarcerated then, and every group I went before was black. <coughs> New Jersey had a bigger population in jail than we had in prison. They had 4,000 4, men in jail. Our future. It's an insult. It's happening to a people who were the first people in the history of the world, and you are right here at an institution where well, you can learn that. It's an insult because it's happening to the first people. The greatest continent on the face of the earth, the largest continent on the face of the earth, where we hail from. Longest running rivers, largest lakes, highest mountains, oldest history, oldest culture, oldest creation. You found no bones in any soil before you found mine. Oh, you were looking at Methuselah a long time ago, you just wouldn't acknowledge it. You want to talk about Lucy? You were looking at who I was when you broke into the pyramids, you knew. You want to talk about aliens? You saw my culture written on the caves and the walls of Africa, so you knew I was already reading and writing. You invaded my cities of Timbuktu, so you knew I already had universities and colleges. You learned that I was first to do medicine. You learned that all the instruments in the world were created in Africa. You learned that 72 and 73 different music scales were from Africa. You learned that the societies alone, Greece and Rome, were fashioned after Mother Africa. That the finest scholars were sent to Timbuktu. You even made joke about it. I'll kick you from here to Timbuktu. But you never gave respect. The oldest history book about me standing here is the Bible that you hate. And let me get it right, because I don't want you to think I don't know what I'm talking about. I know you hate it, because you always solemnly swear to tell the whole truth on me. You have no respect for that. <clears throat> you even do your weddings through it. <clears throat> I know you don't respect that book. But to Africans in America, and Africans anywhere, it's the oldest book about your ancestors. I don't care about the fact that the Greeks meddled with it, that the Romans meddled with it, that, that the Europeans meddled with it last and gave us that last virgin. It's still about me. Every region in the book is a region in Africa. Every tribe in the book is a tribe in Africa. All the people in the book are African people. Why are you denying that and trying to change that? You even deny the fact that the first Christians in the history of the world were Coptic Christians in Africa. You got black people frowning at being Muslims, one of our first and oldest religions. Black people laughed when Sammy Davis became a Jew because we didn't know that was one of the religions that came from our people. It wasn't about a Jewish people that doesn't exist. It was a Jewish faith that was created by our people. But when folks get in the mix of who you are, and empty out who you are. They can then do what they want. They can make Jesus white. They can make angels white and ain't seen one. They can have the three wise men white and what not. Have you thinking that Jesus had a Jericho kit that went bad? <laughs> that his son color came from a tan, what not? They take away your pride and love of self and twist it with their lies and make it theirs. And then they say stupid stuff to you like, what difference does it make what color Jesus was? And you must answer, it didn't make no difference what you're changing for. If it didn't make no difference, why did you spend the time making him brown hair and blonde hair and blue eyes and gray eyes if it didn't make no difference? If it didn't make no difference, why did you go out of your way when we came here as slaves to take the religion from us? If it didn't make no difference, why did you make it mandatory that we couldn't hang on to our Bibles? We couldn't teach or preach. If it didn't make no difference. If it didn't make no difference, why'd you name one of those first slave ships Jesus? If it didn't make no difference. Why did you say things like, oh Lord, 
Up above, wash me white as snow, keep me from the black devil down below. If it didn't make no difference, where were you going <laughs> with our faith? The only thing that we have always believed in, God Almighty, you try to take from us. Many of our young people today don't even experience it. And it was handed down from generations. We made our children close to God. And as we move away from the teaching of thousands of years of our ancestors, we start to look like America, morally bankrupt, running around looking for marijuana and cocaine and crack and alcohol, moving from our own roots. We are spiritual people. None of you Africans in this room can tell me right now. I'll give you an example. There can be an accident on a corner. Two white people collide. Any other white people that come to that scene, including the ones in it, will holler these words. Somebody get an ambulance. And I'm going to tell you the difference about you five seconds after an, after, after an accident. Oh, God. Oh, God, help me, God. Be with me, God. White folks go to surgery and they tell them, I got expert so-and-so. And he's going to do your surgery today. You're in good hands. He lays on down comfortable. But when he sets old Aunt Anna down, Aunt Lucy down, and he tells her, I'm going to do this surgery, and we got a great surgeon in here, and he's going to do the operation. And she looked that white man right up in the face. Oh, God, be with me, God. Don't let this white man hurt me, God. <laughs> Every generation of black people were taught God first. We never looked to the pot of the plane to do nothing. When white folks is fasting in their seatbelt and asking for not another cocktail, we talking to ourselves. All right, God, plane get work, got to go. God, we got no faith in him. We only got faith in God. We know that God can get this plane up and God can get this plane down. And we go straight to God. Oh, God, land this plane safely. Five seconds after we hit the ground. <laughs> Thank you, God. <laughs> we'll go up to the pilot's cockpit. <laughs> I want to thank you for a safe flight. <laughs> he ain't never seen us. Sometimes he's standing there when you get off the plane talking about have a good day. You say, I will now. God landed this way. Huh? Go back to your roots. Go back to what brought us this far, and then you build from there. The bottom line for black America is we're past the time when we can talk about what white folks do and what white folks don't do. And I want to say this to you, and I want you to understand it. All people in America create culture. All people. And you like something about all of them's culture. You like the pretty clothes and the colors that the Mexicans wear when they dance. You like the dance steps that they do. You like some of their art. You love their food. Love their music. Black people love Chinese food. You love the pretty clothes and the colors they wear and the dragons. Black people themselves, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, jazz, spiritual, country western, folk, <coughs> a certain way to walk, a certain way to talk. Keeping it real, being cool. Culture. But in this country, the only culture that has been allowed to flourish, that has been nurtured and protected, is called racism. <coughs> it has lasted from the day we got on the first slave ship to this very moment. They have nurtured and protected and pushed forward out of their culture Racism. That means that you have no more time to talk about what white folks don't do, what white folks need to do. Guess what, folks? No excuses. The only way you can overcome something so blatant that has lasted so long is based <coughs> on what you're going to do. 
It's got nothing to do with him no more. See, because when you wake up to the morning, he will still be racist. When you wake up the day after, he'll still be discriminating. When you wake up the day after, he will still be denying you opportunity. And when you wake up at the end of the month, he will still be doing it based on the hate of color. It is on you as students to build your new tomorrow. You are the last people in America, people of color, with any consciousness and understanding of humanity and decency and fair play and freedom and justice. If you don't change America, America can't change. America has become tone deaf to your suffering. I was in St. Cloud speaking last Saturday, and I said to the group, because they disagreed with that, I said, let me tell you something. Of all the suffering that mankind goes through, I don't see you. I don't see no group of white preachers on the national news or local news speaking out against injustice. I don't see no large gathering of white social workers speaking out against injustice. I don't see no large gathering of white people from any town, any suburb, standing up against injustice and demanding freedom for all mankind. The only time I see you in numbers, in protests, abortion. Now, that's scary. Pro. Hmm? Those that say they pro want to kill now. Those that don't want to kill want to kill us any chance they get. You got to question yourself. What's the argument about? Kill me now, kill me later. I know you're going to kill me. But the bottom line to the madness is three to 400,000 white folks turn out for that. Right in front of you on TV, arguing, fighting, wanting to kill each other. But look at all of the issues where they sit silent, where they have nothing to say. I was speaking at Turning Point yesterday, and a brother said to me, he said, Mr. Moss, it seems like I don't even have the rights of a dog. I said, brother, year 2001, that shouldn't even be coming out your mouth. You should know that by now. Mm. The African in America has no rights afforded any other citizen in America that is born here. We've got to teach that to our people, understand that. All the rights that are afforded Americans are only afforded white Americans. 14th Amendment, all that mess is theirs. You don't have any of those rights born with citizenship. You have a law. Guess what law, y'all? It's called civil rights. And guess who voted for it? White people. If white people voted for civil rights to allow you to sit in this room with them, if white people voted for you to have civil rights to go to a restaurant, civil rights to go to a restroom, civil rights to go to a movie show, civil rights to work, they can also vote to get rid of it. Oh, there's somebody out there saying that who done went crazy now. <coughs> well, I watch white folks sit down. I'd be the first to admit some people were abusive, but not everybody was. Some people needed welfare. But I watch white folks sit down and vote. Y'all seen any welfare? Or is it gone? I remember they talked about an even playing field. Let's bring them up for that 400 years that we locked them out. Let's give them opportunity. We'll call it a front of action. White folks went in a room on a given day and voted it gone. Don't you think for one minute that that little civil rights law you got that lets you sit here this very moment, that he won't raise his hand. He's just waiting for enough allies and a president who won't veto it. That's how far back they want to take you. And if you think there's any doubt about anything I said, or I might say something that's absurd, then you need to look to the last election in Florida. You need to ask yourself a question. How did America allow its own sheriffs, its own police, its own highway patrol, its own political people to get involved in an illegal election and look the other way and ain't nobody arrested to this day? 
people telling police, even white people, the box is right there, you need to turn it in. Get back in the car and just go. Mind your business, woman. Mm. Hiding poles, blocking poles, intimidating, threatening the way it used to be, brother. <coughs> threatening at the pole the way it used to be. Don't you think for one minute white America can change? You have to change. Now, you might think I'm being a little bit harsh, but let me tell you, ain't nothing harsh about honesty. I'm just living through it. You're the one doing it. See, when you stand up and you tell the truth to America, you radical. You militant. You are activist. You can never tell the truth to America. But to your dying breath, you must tell the truth. God is watching you. You must tell the truth to a people who've been denied freedom, justice, and equality all of their lives, all of their existence on this part of the globe. Tell the truth. Let them squirm. Let them act like they care. <coughs> act like you're playing a guilt trip on them. They're not guilty. A white lady told me one day, she said, Mr. Moss, your talk is, is so threatening. <coughs> <laughs> I looked at her and I said, you know what? Either you out your white mind or you think I'm out of my black mind. You sitting there, let me get the list right here. Sheriff, police, highway patrol, FBI, CIA, uh, National Guard, Coast Guard, Navy, Army, Marines, Air Force, nuclear weapons. I'm scaring you. Okay. <laughs> I'm scaring you. You dragged thousands of Indians on the trail of tears, and only a thousand survived. I'm scaring you. You dropped a bomb in the Second World War just to see the effects. I'm scaring you. <laughs> you gave my people syphilis just to see the effects. I'm scared of you. You went over there in Africa and created AIDS. I'm scared of you. I can't scare you. Bush, two days in office, already done dropped the bomb in the Middle East. I'm scared of you. <laughs> well, what you want to do for your first day, President? I don't know. Push that. <laughs> to come up out of poverty, 
to get a real education, to have true health care, and not leave the doctor scarred up like you a Frankenstein monster simply because you're black, or dying on the table because they didn't do their best simply because you're black. Yeah, we want to be free too. So don't twist it up when you leave. And say, I don't know what the hell that black man wanted. <laughs> I want freedom. And I ain't angry about it. That's another lie y'all say. Every time we say something, we angry and we foaming at the mouth. Hell, if we was angry, every time you did something to us, you'd get your head peeled. <laughs> We got a little bit too much Jesus in us sometimes. <laughs> we do more than turn the other cheek. We walk the hell away if you play us like we're crazy. Because we don't do unto you what you do to us when you do it. But if we were doing it back, you would have a different understanding. You would throw with those blacks. They're so hateful. They're doubles. They're killing us. <laughs> we ain't done no crazy stuff to you. Why do you keep lying on us? <laughs> Out of, out of 400 years of murder of us, y'all went berserk when you thought O.J. murdered one. 400 years! Y'all wanted to burn America up. I believe you killed a white woman. Jesus Christ, can I have my crack? <laughs> we had died every way you could die, and y'all ain't said nothing. It's a very serious time for black people to be real. If you ain't got real speakers in front of you, get out the room. I just told my brother here before I started here today, we might have four years, four years, before they've done something so drastic, we go smack out of our mind and get ourselves slaughtered because we're that tired of America. And any of y'all that say you ain't, you're lying. Because it ain't about driving while black. It's about walking while black, talking while black, breathing while black, sleeping while black. You kill us every way you can. It's about going to get your groceries black. It's about going into the apartment store before you can even look at what you want. Can I help you? All of them get behind and follow you. They're so stupid, they're so busy following you that all the white criminals was in the corner of the store ripping them the hell off. That's what it's about. You got about four years because they done lost it. They're starting to defend their dirt. They're starting to find their people not guilty. When they shot that brother in the doorway in New York, the signal was this to us. The cops said on the national news, well, we hear that uh, the grand jury has indicted you. Uh, what are y'all gonna do about it? <coughs> well, we ain't going. What did I say? Grand jury. Who has the power in America to tell the grand jury, you ain't going and don't go? <coughs> and the trial became what? A joke for a young man that held a wallet in the air, hit 19 times out of 42 rounds. Oh, it's on you to wake up. It ain't on nobody else. Every conference you have has to be a conference to build your liberation, to give yourself and your children an opportunity to be healthy and not have that mental illness that comes through us from the oppression that we deal with 24 hours a day that won't even allow us to talk to each other in a decent way. The, the, the kind of oppression that won't let us tolerate each other in our space. The kind of oppression that has developed hatred in us, so much hatred we'll kill each other at the drop of a hat. We got to move from that madness. We got to bring back our own love by getting out of that circle. The truth be known, we've always been a nation within a nation, we just don't act like it. It's time to act like it. We're still talking about who the white man gonna give us this. <laughs> no, you can start demanding what you got coming. But you got coming. I'm shocked. This is the first time I've been here in years to see this many white people in here. I was thinking the last few years, they don't even care down this campus. They don't care enough to even come spy on you. But just black people here. Y'all need to give yourself a hand for coming. Give yourself a hand for coming. I mean, white people didn't even come. How you gonna learn the truth? Don't
Don't be offended by the truth. Don't take it personal. You know the problem with what I say? When you don't want to change. It's not about what I say. When you don't want to change. When you think that all that garbage has been dumped in you is correct and don't even use any common sense to judge it. That's the danger. Not what I say. Will you be a white woman, a white man who is a human being, or will you be a white person living in some white ideology that says you must oppress me? That's the issue. It's not about nothing I said here. A white man once, once said to me in the hallway after a speech, he said, Mr. Moss, and I need to say this to you because one of y'all thinking this already. In your opinion, that just ticked me off. I said, excuse me, in your opinion, because I was listening to your opinion, I said, sir, out of 20 some years, it was 20 some years in, of speaking about injustice and freedom, I have never brought up my opinion. I want to say this to my brothers and sisters. It's not necessary for any of us to give our opinion on this. There's enough documented history. There's enough facts. There's enough media. There's enough videotape. There's enough film. You don't have to give your personal opinion. So I don't want nobody leaving here today talking about his opinion. It's well documented. No speaker who will speak after me will it be his opinion. He will bear witness to the facts, to his reality. When I think about my opinion, the Jewish people won't allow you to put up swastikas. The Jewish people won't allow you to fly a German flag. The Jewish people won't allow you to holler, howl Hitler. The Jewish people won't allow you to embrace or make heroes out of Hitler. And the whole world agrees with them. Flip the script to America and our oppression. Every one of those evil leaders that founded, that made slavery possible, that led the Civil War, their names are on the schools the hospitals, the churches, the libraries, the parks. There's monuments. It ain't just about the Confederate flag. They respect the Martha. They protect it. When you go to Washington, D.C., y'all, don't you ever forget, and please do this for me, stay your butt out of the Washington Monument. That bad boy is the tallest standing anything in Washington. And for you to run up to that with excitement, a man who was the so-called first white president, who had 130 some slaves, who married a wife who had 200 and some slaves, and to teach to our children in grade school, he did not chop down a cherry tree tell me he chopped me down. I should never be caught dead trying to see or take a picture or pay respect to that monument. This man had so many babies by the slaves that on a given day in this country, white folks were so insulted Every one of them threw the name Washington to the ground and never wore it again. And today, when you find a Washington, he look like us. Do me a favor and never go to that monument. Act like you got your mind. Just because a people disrespect you don't mean you should join in and disrespect yourself. And every time I go to Washington, I see our Negroes. <laughs> Get this picture. <laughs> you must be out your rabid mind. A slave owner like that and you trying to be seen in his presence? Well, let me tell you why I said that. 
out of 100 million people that we know for sure, and keep in mind, y'all, it's well over 100 million. What no count. But we know 100 million. They are right now, whether you believe it or not, looking down on us. And you know what they expect of us? You know what their children are saying? You know what those women are saying? We live in Remember me. I died in the ocean. I was four to five hundred deep. We were chained to the floor of the ship. Remember me. A storm came and sunk the ship. We all went down. Remember me. I was on a ship and a fire broke out. <coughs> the ship burned and sunk. Four or five hundred of us. Remember me. The slave ships caught up to us. They opened their cannons and sunk the ship and we went down, remember me. They caught the ship. They hung the captain to the mast. They hung the sailors and then they burnt the ship. The cargo of me, remember me. I made it to the shores. My wife, myself, my four kids. I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what they want. Where are they taking my little girl? Where are they taking my little boy? What are they doing with my wife? What are they talking about? One's in Kansas, one's in Mississippi, one's in Alabama, one's in Arkansas. Ain't gonna see each other again. Remember me? A language that they spoke, gone forever. Remember me? A culture that they loved and protected and nurtured can't be passed on, remember me? Chained to a tree in the middle of the field. Rain coming down, cold and snow, remember me? Raggedy clothes and no shoes, filling the whip every day, remember me? Sitting in slave quarters and shacks shackled to the floor. Brands that give notice to who I belong to, stamped in my back, remember me? A name given, Tom, Jack, Joe, from the master. Remember me, I'm not Tom, I'm Kente. Remember me. People who love to fall to their knees and pray to God, told not to no more. Remember me. Caught looking at a book, blowing out his eyes. Remember me. Spoke back to the master one time too soon, cut out his tongue. Remember me. But master, my daughter, she only 12. Yes, but she had her period. Sent her on up to the big house. Remember me when I screamed tonight, mama? He gonna rape me, mama? My little boy, he's only eight, and I don't even know what it is to be a pervert. Where is he going with my son? Remember me? You black people wake up, and you remember your ancestors who are smiling down on you, asking you, remember me? Remember us, 100 million strong, brought to hells of North America for the purchase of slavery, the building of a nation to be destroyed forevermore. Remember me, y'all. Remember me. what you'd like to see. So please complete them and put them in the box at the back.